Hi everybody, I hope this video finds you well. In today's video, we're going to be working through practice number 12, which focuses on some review questions based on material from exams 1, 2, and 3 in preparation for your final exam. As always, I recommend that you've tried some of these practice questions on your own before watching this solutions video. If you have already tried these questions, well, then let's go ahead and get started. So we'll take a look at question one here, which is a question that relates to material that you saw both on exam one and exam three. Let's go ahead and take a look at the text here. It says, suppose that adult typing speeds are approximately normally distributed with a mean of 44 words per minute and a standard deviation of 16 words per minute. So what's the key information here and how are we going to approach this question? Well, the first thing is that it mentions that the population is approximately normally distributed. That gives us two key pieces of information. One is that by being normally distributed, we know that we have all the information we need if we're given the mean and standard deviation, which we are. We know that the mean is 44 and the standard deviation is 16 words per minute. The second key thing that knowing that this is approximately normally distributed allows us to use is that we can use table A, that table of the normal distribution and proportions from the normal distribution. So that's going to be our main approach. We know we're going to do a lot of the pieces of this question by making use of table A, which also tells us we're going to be making use of that z-score. Let's take a look at the individual questions on the next page where we'll have a little bit more room to work. So on part a here. Again, I'll just go back and underline what we had. So we know that that's crucial. We know that that's crucial. And we know that that's crucial. Well, let's go ahead and look at part A. So part A says, what is the probability that a randomly selected adult types at a speed below 40 words per minute? So here we have a randomly selected adult, so a single adult. By the fact that it's just an individual adult, we know that we're just going to be using the information that's given here. We don't have to use any modifications. We won't need the sampling distribution, nothing like that. We'll just use the information as given because the information given is about the population, and this is an individual from that population. So let's go ahead and start by getting ourselves a diagram here. So we can draw a bell-shaped curve for part A because we know that it's normally distributed. We'll go ahead and label our middle. Remember, the middle is at the mean, which is the 44. Okay. Our point of interest in part A is 40 words per minute. 40 is a little smaller than 44, so it's over here. So that's 40. And then which way are we shading in here? Well, it says we're interested in, in a randomly selected adult typing at a speed below 40 words per minute. So that's smaller than 40 words per minute. So that means we're shading in the stuff to the left here. So we want all that stuff there. All right, now we can go ahead and start calculating the z-score, so the relative position of that point of interest. So that z is going to be the value, 40 minus the mean, 44, divided by the standard deviation, which in this case is 16. As always, we'll go ahead and do the top and bottom separately. So we get minus 4 up top divided by 16. And if we go ahead and put that into our calculator, we should get negative 0.25. Of course, it's a negative z-score because 40 is less than the mean of 44. So of course, we have a negative z-score. Now, what do we do with this negative z-score? Well, now we're going to take this and we're going to go ahead and use table A. We're going to look up that value of negative 0.25. So let's go ahead and look that up on table A. So that should be at the end here. So we're looking up uh, negative 0.25 way down there, but there we go. Okay, so there's the negative 0.2. There's the 0.05, putting those together, looks like we land right there. So remember, we're just intersecting negative 0.2 with the 0.05, and we're getting 0.4013. So let's go ahead and record that, 0 0.4013, 0 0.4013. Okay, now, what? how do we indicate this on our diagram? Well, we know the table A always tells us the stuff to the left. So we know that this area this way is 0 0.4013. Does that match up with our shaded area? Well, we wanted the stuff to the left. Table A tells us the stuff to the left, so that is our answer. So we could say the probability that one adult typing speed is below 40 words per minute 
is indeed equal to 0 0.4013. An equivalent way of phrasing this sort of final answer is saying that 40.13% of adults have a typing speed less than 40 words per minute. Okay, let's go ahead and take a look at part B. So for part B, uh, we're again focusing on a single adult. It says if an adult's typing speed is at the 97th percentile, what is their actual typing speed in words per minute? The difference here is that we know their percentile or the proportion. We know they are better than 97% of other people at typing, and we need to figure out the actual value of their typing speed. So this is what we referenced when we initially did this way back at the beginning of our course as the reverse process. So this is going to be the reverse process which means we're going to sort of do everything in reverse here we can still go ahead and start with a diagram though so let's go ahead and do that so we'll draw ourselves our bell-shaped curve middle still is at 44. our unknown person is at the 97th percentile meaning they're better than 97 percent of other people at typing so they're probably somewhere way down here Zoom in a little bit. there we go so they're somewhere way down here and we know that all of this area to the left, all the people that have typing speeds lower than them, that area must be equivalent to the 97% or 0.97. So there's our unknown person's typing speed. They're way above average, and they're better than 97% of other people. So how do we do this now? Well, remember, this 0.97 is not a z-score. We need to find the z-score. So what we're going to do is we're going to take this and we're going to locate closest thing to 0.97 inside table A. So we're going to go on to table A and we're going to try to find the closest thing to 0.97 on the inside of table A and use that to figure out the z-score. So let's go ahead and do that. So we'll go to table A at the end again. We'll want to go to the positive side of table A because, of course, they're above average. So we're looking for the closest thing to 0.97. Right away, you can see some 0.97s right here. This is a little bit too much. That's 0.9744. There's 0 0.9738, 0 0.9732, 0 0.9726. Okay, this is still a little bit too much. Here's 0 0.9706. This would probably be good. But here's 0 0.9699. This guy is a little bit closer. So we will go ahead and use this. Remember, for our class, as long as you pick one of the two closest ones, so either this one or this one, it's all good. So let's go ahead and circle this guy here. That is the closest one. And if we follow that back out, we can see that our z-score is going to be 1.808. So putting that together, that gives us a z-score of 1.88. So let's go ahead and record that back on our problem. So right here, we just figured out that z is 1.88. So now we know their z-score. In other words, what we're saying is that to be better than 97% of other people, your z-score needs to be 1.88. Now we can set up our z-score equation. So z, which is 1.88, is our unknown value x minus the mean, which is 44, divided by the standard deviation, which is 16. Same formula that we set up up here, except now we know the z and we're trying to solve for x. So we can go ahead and multiply both sides of that equation by 16. So if we go ahead and do that, 1.88 times 16, we will get 30.08 equals x minus 44. Then we can simply add the 44 over to the other side, and we should get 74.08 equals x. So what does that tell us? Well, this is their typing speed, so this is the words per minute that they can type. So this person, or this adult, types at 74.08 words per minute. So to be better than 97% of other people in terms of typing speed, this person would need to type at 74.08 words per uh, minute, which of course does make sense. That is far above the average of 44 minutes, or 44 words per minute. Okay, so in parts A and B, uh, all we did here is we used the original population information, the fact that it was normally distributed. In this way, we sort of did the forward process, which is where we calculated the z-score and used table A to convert it into a proportion. 
In part B, we did the reverse process, which is that we had the proportion or the percentile, converted that into a z-score, and then solved the equation. All right, let's go ahead and take a look at part C. So part C says, what is the probability that five randomly selected adults would all type at a speed below 40 words per minute? So let's go ahead and do that right here. So for C, we want the probability five adults all below 40 words per minute. So what's the key word here? Well, it's the fact that it says all. By it saying all here, what that tells us is that we're going to need to use a probability rule. What we're going to do is we're going to convert this into the probability that one adult is less than 40 words per minute. And we're going to take that and raise it to the fifth power. What we're basically doing there is a saying that we're saying that the way five adults would all be less than 40 words per minute is that the first one would have to be less than 40 words per minute. The second one would type it less than 40 words per minute. The third one, the fourth one, the fifth one. We take each of those probabilities and multiply them together. Since they're all the same, we can just raise that power or that probability to the fifth power. So what is this probability? Well, luckily, that's exactly what we calculated back in part A. We found that probability to play 0.4013. So this should be 0.4013, and we'll raise that to the fifth. And of course, that's something we can just do on our calculator, 0.4013, raise to the fifth. And we should get that that comes out as approximately 0.0104. So while there is about a 40% chance that a single adult would type at a speed less than 40 words per minute, there's only about a 1% chance that a group of five adults would all have typing speeds below 40 words per minute. All right, we've got one more. We will need to go onto a fresh page for this last one, though. So let's go ahead and do that. So for part D, Let's go back and take a look at the question. So for part D, what is the probability? Again, five randomly selected adults, but this time we want their average speed to be below 40 words per minute. So now we want the probability, five adults, average less than 40 words per minute. So again, this is a different question than what we did in part C, because here we just want their average to be less than 40 words per minute. So some of them can have typing speeds over 40, as long as as a group, their average is below 40. So what's the key here? Well, whenever we see average, this means that we're going to go ahead and use the sampling distribution. So remember, the sampling distribution comes with also needing to know the size of the sample. In this case, it's those five adults. So we're going to be using the sampling distribution with n equals 5. So since this is a new distribution, we need to know its center, its standard deviation, and its shape. So what is the center or the mean for the sampling distribution? Well, the central limit theorem, which we covered back around exam three, tells us that the mean for the sampling distribution is the same as the mean of the population. So in this case, it's still going to be those 44 words per minute. What about the standard deviation? Well, we learned that the standard deviation shrinks by a factor of the square root of n. So it's the original standard deviation, which was 16, divided by the square root of the sample size. So we have 16 divided by square root of 5. So if we calculate that real quick, it looks like the standard deviation that we'll be working with is approximately 7.2 words per minute. And the shape, well, the third and final component of the central limit theorem told us that the sampling distribution's shape is always more normal than the population. In this case, the population was already normal, so the shape here will still be normal. Still normal. Okay, so since it's still normal, we can still draw our bell shaped curve, use the z-score, and use table A. The only thing we have to keep in mind is that our mean is 44, and our standard deviation now, though, is 7.2. So let's go ahead and do that. We'll draw our bell shaped curve. There's the middle at 44. Our point of interest is 40, so we'll draw that in over here. We're interested in their average being less than 40. So once again, we're shading into the left here. Remember, if we were shading into the right, we would need to do 1 minus the answer that we found from table A. But since we're shading into the left, we'll just be able to use whatever we find on table A. 
Now let's go ahead and calculate our z-score. So our point of interest, 40, minus our mean, 44, divided by our new standard deviation, which is 7.2. If we go ahead and do that, that's going to be minus 4 over 7.2. And if we go ahead and type that into our calculator, minus 4 divided by 7.2, it looks like we should get a z-score of about negative 0.56. So let's go ahead and look that up on table A and see what we get there. So we're looking at negative 0 0.56. So we'll go to table A. So back on the negative side here. So there's negative 0 0.5 and there's the 0 0.06. So putting those together, looks like we should end up right there at 0.2877. So 0.2877. All right, so once we did that, we got 0.2877. As always, that is the stuff to the left. That does line up exactly with our shaded area, so no need to modify it by doing like one minus. So we can simply say that the probability that a group of five have an average below 40 words per minute is equal to 0.2877. In other words, there's about a 28.77% chance that if you took a random group of five adults, their average typing speed, not saying that all of them would necessarily be less than 40 words per minute, but their average speed would be less than 40 words per minute. So there we go. This walked us through how to deal with several different situations that arise from normally distributed data. We talked about in parts A and B, how to work with an individual. We talked about in part C, how to work with a group all having a particular trait and in part d we talked about how to work with a group having an average trait okay let's go ahead and move on to question two so in question two which is an exam two review this is something that you can find on exam two if you're interested uh, this is going to be a correlation and regression question so let's go ahead and see what we have here we're going to say we're interested in studying the relationship between the number of customers a coffee shop has per day and the profit that they make that day. So to study this, they randomly select nine days to visit the coffee shop, and they record the number of customers who come in that day and the overall profit of the shop make, that the shop makes that day. So they have these different days where they got different amounts of customers, and then they recorded their profit. So like on this, the first day they had 60 customers, and they made a profit of $180. Down here, they had a day where they had 100 customers, and they made a profit of $550. So we've got a couple things to do. We're going to draw our scatter plot, uh, and we're going to make sure to label our axes. We're going to calculate the correlation coefficient, decide if there's enough evidence for a correlation. We're going to give the equation of the LSR. Remember, that's the linear model that best fits the data. We're going to interpret the components of the LSR, the slope and the intercept. We're going to make a prediction using the LSR. And we're going to calculate the residual. Sometimes we've done full residual plots where we calculate the residual of every point. But in this case, we're going to calculate the residual just for the very first data point. So let's go ahead and do this. Again, we'll move on to a fresh page with the data, just to have a little bit more space. So to start off with, we need to do part A, which is we want to come up with a scatter plot. So before we can actually draw that scatter plot, we need to make sure we know which variable is being treated as explanatory and which is being treated as response. So remember, the explanatory is the one we think explains at least some of the changes in the response. So in other words, does it make more sense to say that the number of customers helps explain your profit or that the profit helps explain the number of customers? Well, chronologically, it would make more sense to think that the number of customers helps explain your profit because first we'd want to see how many customers we get, and we probably would think we could use that to tell how profitable the day is. So that means that this is going to be our explanatory, and we're going to make sure to pop that data into L1 when we get to our calculator, and this is going to be the response, and we're going to pop that into L2 when we get there. But for now, we'll go ahead and build our scatter plot. So remember, that's going to be a quarter of a coordinate axis. The explanatory variable has to go on the horizontal, the response has to go on the vertical. So for this here, this is gonna be number of customers. It looks like the lowest number of customers was 60, highest was 145. So we could do something like maybe start at 60, then go say 80, 100, 120, 140, 
and 160. Remember, you don't have to start this axis at zero. However, notice that this right here would not be zero. This would technically be like 40. So what I'm gonna do is I'm just gonna draw a little squiggly line showing that that part of the axis has been condensed. For the profit, it looks like the lowest profit uh, was 180 and the highest was 550. So I might go ahead and just start with 150. Uh, maybe we'll go by hundreds. There's 250. 350, 450, and 550. Once again, I'm going by hundreds there. Notice that that would mean that this guy here would be 50. That's not what we would normally expect. So we'll just condense the axis there. We'd expect it to be zero. So let's go ahead then, and, and we'll go ahead and label our axes as well. So this is the number of customers, and this is the profit up here. All right, let's go ahead and plot these points then. So first one, number of customers 60, profit 180. So that should put us somewhere uh, right about there. Then we had number of customers 145 and profit of 510. So that looks like that should put us uh, maybe somewhere right about there. Uh, 130, oh, I'm sorry, I misread. The highest profit is 780, oops. Well, we can just go ahead and extend our axis a little bit. Just need to scoot that up. Nothing wrong with that. So we'll just continue that axis up. There's 650. There's 750. There's 850. My apologies on that. So that's the profit. Okay. So third data point, uh, 130 and 780. So 130... And 780 should be somewhere right about up there. Then we had 70 customers and 245. So that should be right about there. Then 75 customers and 340. So we'll slide this guy over just a little bit. 70 should be right in the middle. There we go. Now 75 and 340. So that looks like maybe right about there. Uh, then we had 115 and 520. And that should be probably right about, right about there. Okay. Then we had 100 and 550. So there we go, right about there. And we've got 85 and 340. Uh, so 85 and 340. There we go, right about there. And then we've got 90 and 315. So 90 and 315 looks like it should be right about there. Okay, so, and again, we had uh, nine days. So we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine data points there. What sort of pattern are we seeing? Well, again, it's not a perfect uh, upward pattern, but we do definitely see an upward direction. As the customers increase, we're generally seeing an increase in the profit. Now, of course, there was this day, which had only the second highest number of customers, but the most profit. So it's not a strict overall uh, sort of pattern there, but overall, we would classify this as a positive directed pattern. So when we go to calculate our correlation coefficient, which is what we're going to be doing in part B, well, then we do expect to see a positive correlation coefficient. So let's go ahead and do that in part B. So in part B, we have two things to do. We want to calculate the correlation coefficient, and we want to decide if there's enough evidence for a correlation. So let's first talk about how to get the correlation coefficient. So this is going to be from our calculator. So if you have your data, you want to go ahead and put this explanatory into L1 and this response into L2. I will go ahead and do that. So in L1, we've got 60, 145, 130, 70, 75, 115, 100, 85, and 90. And then in L2, let's go ahead and do that. So in L2, we want to match these up. So 180, 510, 780, 
245, 340, 520, 550, 340, and 315. Then what we're going to do to actually calculate this is we're going to go to stat and then calc and then lin reg ax plus b. Remember this lin reg ax plus b is not only going to give you the correlation coefficient, but it's also going to give you the slope and the intercept, which we're going to need for part c, which is the LSR. So definitely important to know how to use that. So stat calc lin reg ax plus b, make sure it's set to L1 and L2 and nothing in the frequency list. Then you can go ahead and calculate. And it looks like when you do that, you should get an R of about 0.83. And then after we round, looks like it should become six zero. So there's our correlation coefficient. And notice it is positive, as we said, because we're seeing generally a positive direction to this pattern. How do we decide if this is strong enough? Well, remember, the closer it is to plus or minus one, the stronger the correlation. To determine if this is close enough to one, what we do is we get that critical value from table E. So now we're gonna go ahead and use table E. To go on to table E, we need to know how many data points we had. In this case, we had N equals nine. So let's see what that tells us about the critical value. So we'll go ahead and grab a color for that. So let's go to table E, have that at the end here. There we go n equals 9. Remember on table E, we always use the 0.025 column. So putting those together, looks like our critical value is 0.6664. So in other words, if our R value is over that, then we have enough evidence. If our R value is under that, then we don't have enough evidence. So if we look at that, the critical value is 0.6664. So ours is 0 0.8360, that is bigger than the critical value. So what we would say is that since the absolute value of R is greater than the critical value, this implies enough evidence for a positive correlation. So in other words, we do believe there is a positive pattern between the number of customers this shop gets and the profit they make. All right, let's go ahead and look at part C. So part C asked us for the LSR, which of course we can get from that stat calc lin reg AX plus B. Looking at the equation here, looks like we should have Y hat equals after rounding 5.5 X, uh, and then looks like minus 107.2. So there we go, there is our LSR. If you prefer, you can plug in the response and the explanatory. So what was the response? It was the profit. So the predicted profit is equal to 5.5 times the number of customers, which was our explanatory, minus 107.2. Again, for when you're asked to construct the LSR, all you need to do is just give the equation of it. All right, now for part D, we're supposed to go ahead and talk about the slope and then in E, we'll talk about the intercept. So we're gonna look at the components of this LSR. So for D, first we need to remember which value is the slope. So the slope here is gonna be that 5.5. So the slope is the 5.5. So algebraically, what does slope mean? We know that it means that when you go up one in X, the slope is what happens to Y. So you go up 5.5 in Y. Notice we say you go up 5.5 since the slope here is positive. If it was a negative, we'd say you go down 5.5. Well, what does it mean to go up one in X here? Well, X was the customer. So this means that when you go up one customer, then we expect you to go up 5.5 in the profit. So now we just need to write out a sentence explaining what that means. So we'd say for each additional customer, we expect an additional $5.5 of profit. So our model predicts for each additional customer, the shop receives $5.50 of profit. So 
In other words, we're basically saying that for each additional customer that the shop brings in on a particular day, they expect to gain about $5.50 of profit. All right, let's talk about part E then, the intercept. So we'll do this in uh, green here. The intercept is right there. So the intercept is negative here. It's negative 107.2. What does the intercept mean algebraically? Well, we know that this is what happens when x is 0. The intercept gives us the corresponding value of y. So again, what does the x and y variables represent? Well, the x variable is the customers. So when the customers equal 0, the profit is supposed to be negative 107.2. So what does this mean? Well, this is basically saying what happens if the shop gets no customers on a particular day. So we would say our model predicts that on a day with no customers, the shop loses $107 and 20 cents. So in other words, if there's a day where the shop is open, but nobody comes in, they expect to lose $107 and 20 cents that day. And that should seem to make sense, right? Because there's probably operating costs that the shop has. So if nobody shows up, they lose money. So in other words, putting these two together, we're basically saying that each day the shop is open, they have about $107 of operating costs. And then for each person that comes in, they make about $5.50 of profit. So they have to get a certain number of customers each day just to even break even. If they get more than that, well, then of course, they would actually begin to make money for that day. All right, we've got a couple more pieces to sort of wrap up here for part uh F, we wanted to do what is the predicted profit on a day where they get 120 customers. So let's do that. So predicted profit with 120 customers. So anytime you need to make a prediction, what that tells you is that you just need to plug into your model. So we know that they're going to have 120 customers, so we will simply plug that in for X. So we will put that the predicted profit here is equal to 5.5 times 120 minus that 107.2. And if we go ahead and just put that into our calculator, so we can just type that in directly, 5.5 times 120 minus 107.2. We should get that that comes out as 552.8. So with 120 customers, we predict a profit of $552.80. So with 120 customers, we predict profit of $552.80. Now, there was a small follow-up question to this. It said, would you trust this prediction? So how do we determine when we're making predictions whether or not we can trust them? Well, we have to look at the explanatory range. We're making a prediction with 120 customers. Notice back up here that in our data range, our customers, the number of customers ranged from 60 to 145. So we can trust this prediction. Trust this since 120 is inside the explanatory range, which again was the lowest was 60, the highest was 145. So 60 to 145. So what kind of predictions would we not be able to trust? Well, we probably wouldn't want to trust this model if we were trying to predict, say, if we got 300 customers, right? 300 customers would be way outside the observed range of data. So again, the way we determine if we can trust a prediction is based on whether or not is it, it is close to the explanatory range. And the explanatory range is just the lowest and highest observed values of the explanatory variable. All right, we've got one last part. We'll need one a little more page here. So last part here, we want to calculate the residual for the very first point data point in our set. So uh, this is the residual for first 
data point. So what was the first data point? Well, just looking back, it was where we had customers of 60 and a profit of 180. So how do we calculate a residual? Well, remember the residual is the response minus the predicted response. So we can add a couple columns here. We have to make a predicted profit and then the residual. And just as a little note, we'll just remember the residual is equal to y minus y hat. So if we can fill this in, then we just take this minus this, and that'll give us the residual. You guys are probably pretty used to doing this as a full table for all the data points, but of course this time we only need to do it for the first one. So how do we find this predicted profit? Well, we since it's a prediction, we just plug in. We know that the predicted profit is equal to 5.5 times the number of customers, which is 60, minus that 107.2. Popping that into our calculator, 5.5 times 60 minus 107.2 gives us something like 222.8. So we'll pop that in here, 222.8. And that means our residual is 180 minus 222.8. So 180 minus 222.8. And it looks like our residual here should be negative 42.8. Remember, residuals could be positive or negative. What does this negative residual mean here? We'll just circle it since that's our answer. Right. Well, what this is saying is that According to our model, a day where we had 60 customers, we should have made a profit of around $222.80. According to our data, we only made $180 that day, so we underperformed, according to our model, by about $42.80. So this day, according to our model, was a bad day based on the number of customers and the profit that we made. All right, so this question here, uh, the second question dealt with correlation and regression, which is what we do when we're looking at the relationship between two quantitative variables. We did everything from the visual display, the scatter plot, to the correlation coefficient and the use of table E. Remember, this is the one thing that we use table E for, which is finding the critical value and determining if there's enough evidence for a correlation. We interpreted the components of the LSR, slope and intercept. Did a quick reminder about how predictions are just plugging in to the model. And then finally, did a quick reminder about residuals. Sometimes we do the residuals for all the data points. Sometimes we just do it for a specific one. We just went ahead and filled out the chart for that one data point we were interested in. All right, let's get to question three. So question three is also uh, from exam two or an exam two sort of related topic. Let's go ahead and look at the question. So it says, suppose that 24% of U.S. households own a cat. We're going to further suppose that each household is independent and that you have a random sample of 12 households. All right, we have some probabilities to calculate. So how are we going to approach this? Well, some of the key phrasing here, first that word independent. Once we see this, what we start to think about is we start to think about whether or not this is a binomial. Remember, a binomial is a probability experiment, which is independent. It has a couple other features, which we're going to talk about in a second. But if this thing is a binomial, then we have a binomial formula that lets us calculate these things. So what has to be true for a binomial? Well, the first is that there are supposed to be two outcomes. So each time we look at a household, there are two outcomes. They either own a cat, which we, I guess we would consider a success here, or do not own a cat which we would consider a failure here. For part two, right, they need to be independent, which is told to us, so we know that, so we're good. And then for step three, we need to know how many trials and the probability of success. So we're looking at a random sample of 12 households, so we know that n is 12, and we know the probability of a success, considering that the success is owning a cat, has to be that 24%, which in other words is 0.24. Now, sometimes we also like to make a note of the chance of failure, 1 minus p, which in this case would be 0.76, which should make sense. If 24% of households own a cat, 76% of households do not own a cat. So this is indeed a binomial. It has all the components of that. So we can go ahead and use that binomial formula. 
So let's remind ourselves of the binomial formula. What the binomial formula says is that the probability of exactly k successes is equal to nck p to the k 1 minus p to the n minus k. So we use the combinations to count up all the ways it can happen. Probability of success to the number of successes. Probability of failure to the number of failures. So let's look at part A then. So we want to calculate the probability. Exactly 5 have cats. Okay, so that means we want exactly 5 successes. That's exactly what this formula can do. So our number of trials is 12. So we will do 12C5. The probability of success is 0.24. We want five successes because we want exactly five of the households to have cats. And then 0.76, that's the chance of failure. How many failures? Well, if we have 12 households, five are supposed to be successes. The remaining ones, 12 minus five, would be seven. So we're supposed to have five with cats, seven without. Putting that into our calculator, uh, remember to get the uh, 12C5, we first type in 12, then hit math, go across to PRB, go down to NCR, put in the five, hit enter. That gives us the 12C5, which should be 792. Then you can multiply by 0.24 to the fifth, and then multiply that by 0.76 to the seventh. And after we do all that, we should get our final answer here of approximately 0.092. Uh, four after rounding. So what we're saying is if we're looking at a group of 12 households, there's about a 9% chance that exactly five of those 12 households would have a cat. All right, let's go ahead and look at part B. Part B says the probability less than three have cats. Well, this is not an exact amount, but we can figure out what exact amounts would satisfy this. Having less than three would be the, the same as exactly zero, one, or two have cats. So if none of the households have a cat, we're good. If one of them has a cat, we're good. If two of them have a cat, we're good. If three or more of them have a cat, though, then that would not be less than three. So what does this mean? Well, we're going to use our formula three times. Once for zero successes, once for one success, and once for two successes. So let's go ahead and do that. For exactly zero, that would be 12C0, 0 0.24 to the zero, 0.76 to the 12. That's all of them being failures. Then we're going to add 12C1, 0 0.24 to the one, 0.76 to the 11. That's one household having a cat, 11 not having cats. And then 12C2, 0.24 to the 2, 0.76 to the 10. That's two households having a cat, 10 of them not having a cat. All right, we'll go ahead and calculate each of these separately, and then we're going to add them up. Why are we adding each of these? Well, because we could have this one, or this one, or this one. Remember, whenever you have an or, you use addition with probability. So for that first one, putting it into the calculator, looks like we should get basically 0 0.0371. Then for the next one, uh, let's see what we get there. Uh, we should get 0 0.1407. And then finally for the last one, 12C2. Okay, then times 0.24 squared, and then times 0.76 to the 10. Looks like the last one should be 0.2444. All right, now we just add all those together. So 0.0371 plus 0.1407 plus 0.2444. And after we add all those up, we should get 0.4222. So the probability that less than three of the households have cats, so either zero households, one household, or two households, comes out to about 42.22%. So if you have a non-exact amount like this, you might need to use your formula several times. All right, 
finally, for part C, we want the probability that at least one of the households owns a cat. So probability at least one has a cat. So what exact amounts would that be? Well, that would be exactly one, because one is at least one, or two, or three, or four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, or twelve. Any of these amounts would be at least one. I know I can't go higher than twelve because we only have twelve households. So the most households that could have a cat out of twelve is twelve. So exactly one through twelve. Now this is using our formula a lot if we want to go ahead and do that. I think this is using it twelve times. So I don't think we want to go down that route. So instead what we're going to do is we're going to use the complement rule. We're going to do one minus p of exactly any amounts that are not on this list. Well, this list goes from 1 to 12, so there's only one option that's not on this list, which would be exactly 0. The only way you do not have at least 1 is if it's exactly 0. So we're using the complement rule to make this a lot simpler. It's actually really easy because exactly 0 is something we calculated back here. It was done right there. So this is 1 minus 0 0.0371, which after calculating is 0 0.9629. So there's about a 96.29% chance that out of 12 households, at least one has a cat. All right, so these three questions here were a review of how to use the binomial formula to calculate probabilities. The tip-off to using this is, of course, the mention of independent and the fact that we knew the probability of success and we knew the sample size. So those are all things that tell us to use that binomial formula. All right, we've got one last question here, which sort of looks at a related situation to question three, but tells us how to work with something that is dependent rather than independent. So let's look at our final practice problem here. So for question four, which is also a review from exam two, we're going to suppose that you have a large box of donuts. Inside the box, you have 10 double chocolate donuts, 13 glazed donuts, six cinnamon donuts, and nine maple donuts. We're going to suppose you randomly pull out five of these donuts. So a couple things probably one we want to make note of first. Well, always good to know the total. So we have 10 and 13, that's 23, plus six, that's 29, plus 9, that sounds like 38. So we have 38 total. We're also important to recognize that we're pulling out five of these at a time. And we should also note that this is dependent. Now you might say to yourself, how do we know that this is dependent? It doesn't say that here. Well, it's sort of by common sense. As you pull things out of the box, you change what's in the box. If the first couple donuts that you pull out are cinnamon donuts, there are less cinnamon donuts left, right? If you pull out a couple glazed donuts, then there's less glazed donuts. So this is dependent. As you pull things out of the box, you change what's in there. So whenever you, as a note here, whenever you have multiple selections, plus dependent, what we go ahead and do is we use what we called the counting method. So this question is going to be reviewing how to use that counting method. So for part A, we want the probability that they're all glazed. So how do we do that? Well, we're going to set up a fraction. In the denominator, we're going to count up all the things that can happen overall. Well, we're picking 5 from 38. So we can do that as 38C5. For the numerator, we base that on what we want to happen, have happen, which is that they should be all glazed. So we still need to pull out 5, but we can only pick those 5 from those 13. So it should be 13C5. 13C5, that counts up all the ways to get 5 glazed donuts out of 13. 38C5 says all the ways we can pull out 5 donuts from 38 total. Okay, so if we go ahead and put that into our calculator, 13 C5, so 13 math PRB C5, and then we go ahead and divide by 38 math PRB C5, we should get that that comes out as approximately 
0.0026. So there's about a 0.26% chance, so a very low probability, that if you pulled out five donuts, all of them would be glazed. That should make sense. While there are more glazed donuts than anything else, there are still plenty of other types, and pulling out five in a row from the glazed donuts is going to be pretty hard. All right, so let's look at B then. Probability no cinnamon. All right, going to have the same denominator because we're still pulling out five donuts from the 38. But now we want to avoid the cinnamon donuts. So if we avoid the cinnamon ones, we have 10, 13, and another 9 to pick from. 10 plus 13 is 23, plus the 9 is 32. So we have 32 C5. As long as we're choosing from the maple, the glazed, or the double chocolate, we're avoiding those cinnamon ones. Going ahead and putting that into our calculator, 32 C5, and then divided by that 38. Uh, 38 C5. Looks like we should get overall that that comes out as approximately 0 0.4012. So we've got a little over a 40% chance that when we pull out those five donuts, none of them are cinnamon. All right, for C, we want the probability of exactly two maple. Key here to remember is that if you're gonna have exactly two maple, you still need to pull out five donuts. So that means you also have to have exactly three non-maple. So you've got to get two maple ones, and you've got to get three that are not maple, meaning chocolate, glazed, or cinnamon. So let's see how we would calculate that. Denominator, still 38 C5. For getting the two maple, that should be pretty easy. There's nine maple to choose from, so it would be 9 C2. Then we multiply, choosing exactly three non-maple. So avoid the maple. 10 and 13 is 23, plus the other 6 from cinnamon, that is 29. So as long as we choose the other 3 from those 29, we'll have guaranteed that we've gotten 2 maple, and we don't accidentally get any more maple. Remember, since we want exactly 2, we have to make sure we get 2, but we can't get any more, because then we would have 2 or more. So going ahead and doing that, uh, if we type in the numerator, so... We get our 9 and then C2. And we're multiplying. Remember, anytime we need to glue together several counting things, we always do multiplication. So we get that there. And then we will divide by the 38 C5. And let's see what our result is there. Looks like that comes in as approximately 0.2621. So there's about a 26% chance that we would end up with two maple and three non-maple, meaning exactly two maple. All right, last one. We want the probability that we get three double chocolate and two cinnamon. So how do we do this? Well, same denominator, 38C5. For the three double chocolate, well, we go right to the double chocolate. There's 10 of those. So that's going to be 10 C3. And then the two cinnamon, well, there were six cinnamon, so six C2. And of course, we glue those together with multiplication. So 10 and then C3. And then we'll go ahead and multiply that with six and C2. And then we'll go ahead and divide that by our standard 38. C5. Once we do all that, it looks like that should come out as approximately 0 0.0036. So there we go. A little under a half a percent chance that we would get three double chocolate and two cinnamon. So a couple things to remember here. First of all, whenever you see something like this where you're choosing multiple things out of a group, Right? That's going to be a dependent situation because as you pull things out, you change what remains. Whenever something is dependent and you have multiple selections, so you're pulling out four, five, six, seven things, you want to use this counting method. For the counting method, the numerator always corresponds to the thing you actually want. 
and the denominator should stay the same, it's always just based on how many you're pulling out and how many total you have overall. So you should definitely compare and contrast questions three and four. Question three looks at how to deal with independent situations. Question four looks at how to deal with dependent situations. So again, this practice hopefully helped you guys review some of the older material from exam one, two, and three. Definitely does not cover everything from those earlier things. So you should definitely still go ahead and look over the solutions for exam one, exam two, and exam three to refresh yourself on some of the things we didn't talk about here. But this hopefully gives you guys a little bit of additional practice reviewing some of that older material.